this weekend our theme is Faith Works. Uh, so I want to start off here for a second and do a little bit of an illustration. So can I get a volunteer, preferably someone who is comfortable, uh, one, being in front of people and taking instructions? All right, Jonathan, come on up here. All right, I want you to stand right there, okay? Face me. All right, so I'm going to give you a set of instructions, okay? Now, first of all, do you trust that I'm not going to harm you? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I want you to come stand up here on this step, on that first step. Now, just hop up to this next step, okay? Now, can you hop backwards? All right, hop down to the next one. All right, hop back up to that one. Okay, perfect. You did great. All right, so we're going to make this a little bit harder. What I'm going to do is go ahead and stand back on the floor, and I'm going to put this blindfold on you. I'm not going to fall in. Courtesy of Jackson. All right. I probably should have folded this before. I Can this wrap around your head? I don't know. Let me do it the other way. Yeah, let's do it this way. All right. Let me put it around you. All right. So now I'm going to give you another instruct, a couple more instructions. But do you trust that I'm not going to harm you in any way? Yeah. Okay. So I want you to take a few steps back to your right. To your right. Come back over to your right. This way. There you go. Is that right? You're right? Yeah. All right. Keep going. Come back over to your left a little bit. Take a little bit of a step back. All right. Now I want you to sit down. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you did a good job. Everybody give, him, give Jonathan a round of applause. All right, here you go. Hand me the, you go ahead and sit down. All right, so before we talk about what just happened with Jonathan, let me ask you guys a question. Would you say that belief and faith are the same thing? Okay. Would you say that they're synonymous terms, even in Scripture? Think about that before, before we uh, get into this. How did Jonathan just display belief? In that illustration, how did Jonathan display belief? And let me give you a definition of belief before you answer. An acceptance that a statement is true or that something exists. So how did Jonathan display belief in that illustration that we just did? Okay, yeah, so he, he acknowledged or believed that I said, when I said, I'm not going to harm you, he trusted that, right? Or he acknowledged that he believed it. All right, so how did Jonathan then demonstrate faith in that illustration? He had faith that there was a chair there. Okay, he had faith that when I, what, whatever instructions I gave him, I was not going to harm him, Right and the fact that he actually followed through. And the key piece here to faith is that there's trust involved, isn't it? Trust is the key when it comes to faith. Jonathan demonstrated belief by obeying my instructions and faith by doing just as my instructions directed. Now, if I had told Jonathan to get on top of this building and jump off the building and that I would catch him, do you think that Jonathan would do it? I don't know, Jonathan says he would do it, so I don't know. Um, while Jonathan might have acknowledged that, yes, I trust that you're not going to harm me, I highly doubt that Jonathan would have the actual faith to believe that, right? By getting on this building and jumping and, and trusting that I'm going to catch him. Think about these principles spiritually. And all of this is just to, to illustrate a point. Simply believing in God does not mean that we have faith in Him. I want to take you to a passage 
James chapter 2. If you don't have your Bible with you, I'll read these passages uh, from up here. But James chapter 2, and we're going to get into this passage a little bit more tomorrow if you're here tomorrow for uh, worship. But look at verse 19. James says, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. You know what that verse tells me? You know what that verse should tell us? Is that just believing that there is a God is not enough. Just believing that God is the one true God is not enough. Just believing that this is his word is not enough. James tells us even the demons believe. While many of you in this room may claim belief in God today, how have you demonstrated your faith? And that's what this whole weekend is about, right? Faith working. Faith works. How have you demonstrated that your faith, your belief in God, is living and working in the way that you live, the way that you talk, the way that you behave? I'm not going to focus so much this morning on how we do that. More so, I'm going to focus on how do we bridge that gap between what we say that we believe and actually living that. What's, what goes in between there? And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to identify how we move from belief to true faith and what that faith looks like in our lives as faith-filled believers. What we're really going to focus on this morning is conviction. What conviction is and what it looks like. So let's, let's define conviction. I want to ask you guys first, what would you say that conviction is? How would you define conviction? Do you guys know what that word means? To be convicted in something, what we're, what, the idea that we're trying to convey here is that you have a specific stance or a position or a view you're convicted of that. Go ahead. Um, moved with determination. Okay, yeah, that's a good definition. Moved with determination. There's, it implies that action behind it, right? What we're talking about here in, in defining conviction this way is a specific belief or stance or conviction or position and how that influences the way that we move. That she defined it. Conviction conveys with it the idea of firmness. When you think about someone being convicted of something, you, you kind of have that, com that concept of that idea of being firm and grounded and unwillingness to be swayed. And I just want to take you to a passage here in Ephesians chapter 4. I want you to see that Paul, when talking to the Ephesians, actually wanted this very thing from the Ephesian church. In Ephesians chapter 4, look at verses 13 through 15. We're really going to focus on verse 14. It says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, till we should no longer, or that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. The illustration that Paul gives here to the Ephesians is somewhat of this idea of a ship at sea. And if a ship is at sea and it has no rudder, it has no uh, sails, I'm not 100% sure how ships work in every way. <laughs> but if it has nothing to direct its course, it's just going to be tossed about, isn't it? It's going to go wherever the wind tells it to go. Very similarly, he gives the illustration of a child. A child is going to do whatever you tell them to do. They're putting their full confidence and trust in you. And if you tell them to do one thing, they'll do it. If they tell them to do the other thing, they'll do it. What Paul is saying is, I want you to be grounded. I want you to be firm. I want you to have a direction, a conviction, 
about coming to a full understanding, really what he's talking about here is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what he says in verse 13. Paul's encouragement to the Ephesians was that as a church, and that's the key, right? As a body of believers, they become convicted in their faith concerning Christ. It's not just me going on and studying the Word and and leaving you all behind. It's we help one another become convicted in our beliefs. Conviction is essential. If we want, and and I trust that you guys want this, if we want to remain faithful throughout our lives, it's our responsibility to help not only ourselves, but one another become convicted in our beliefs. So let's talk a little bit about what conviction looks like. And I want to, again, go to Scripture to look at this. Turn to Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, if you're familiar with the context here, <clears throat> Peter and John are back in Jerusalem after Acts chapter 2, right? The, the church has been established. And here in chapter 3, prior to chapter 4, they heal a lame man at the gate of one of the gates of the temple. And they're called into question for that. They're actually arrested. And in chapter 4, they're brought before this council, this, uh, uh, these, the Sanhedrin council. And let's look at verses 5 through uh, 7. It says, It came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, who was also the high priest when Jesus was crucified, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? So can you imagine being Peter and John, especially Peter, right? We, we know Peter's history up until this point. Denying Jesus, being questioned not by the Sanhedrin council, but just random people who are in the courtyard. And now here he is brought before the very leaders of, of the Jewish people, and they question and say, by what power or authority are you doing these things? And we see a very different response from Peter than we saw back when Jesus was arrested, don't we? Look at verses 10 through 13. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel, this is Peter speaking, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now listen to verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Interestingly enough, they said that same thing about Jesus. What is it that we see different about Peter in this passage, according to verse 13? What is it? What's different about Peter? Boldness. He had boldness. What do you think it was that led Peter to be so bold in this moment? It's exactly what we're talking about here this morning. It's conviction. We talk as Christians uh, whenever we're here together in the building or at, at Bible studies about being bold and taking a stand for Jesus when we're out in the world. Being bold for Jesus doesn't just happen. It comes because we are convicted of the things that we believe and the things that we profess and confess about Jesus. If we lack boldness, we have to ask ourselves, am I really convicted about Jesus? If someone is questioning you or making fun of you about your faith, 
and you lack the boldness to, to take a stand and defend the things that you believe, ask yourself, where is my conviction? Am I convic convicted? Am I firm? Do I have a strong stance or position, as we defined it earlier, about Jesus? Conviction, when present, looks like firmness in the face of opposition, doesn't it? And we see that here in the example of Peter and John. Another way that we see firmness, or excuse me, conviction, or a thing that accompany, accompanies, excuse me, conviction, is the sound and reasonable judgment. And I just want to show you um, here in Acts 4, verse 11, notice that Peter actually quotes from the Old Testament to convince these leaders about Jesus, of who he was and what he, what he came to preach and, and proclaimed himself to be. Going back to chapter 2, he does the same thing. He quotes from Joel chapter 2. And he quotes from uh, a couple different psalms. See, Psalm 16, Psalm 110. So Peter is using the things that these men were familiar with to convince them of who Jesus was and why they were doing the things that they were doing. And, you know, Paul had the same practice. In Acts chapter 17, we see that Paul made it a, a, a practice to go into the synagogues on the Sabbath when the Jews were gathered together. And it tells us in Acts 17 and verse 2 that he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. He explained and demonstrated that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. This is a very important point, and I want you guys to remember this. Conviction is not just being passionate about what you believe. It's not just having an emotional response when someone mentions the name Jesus, and I raise my hands and I say, Amen, Jesus is the Son of God. That's not, that's not what conviction is. What we see in Peter and John, we see it in Paul, is that conviction is a sound, reasonable understanding of why we are convinced of the truth of Jesus Christ. The example here that we see in the, in the uh, book of Acts over and over again is going back to the Old Testament. Jesus did the same thing. He would quote from the Old Testament to show himself to be the Son of God. Conviction carries with it a reasonable, sound understanding of why we believe what we claim to believe. These are just a couple aspects of what conviction looked like. And there's other things we could add to this list. But if we lack one or the other, if we lack boldness, or if we lack a sound understanding, reasonable understanding of why we claim what we believe, our own conviction, as well as our influence on non-convicted believers, is going to be greatly diminished. It's vital. It's vital that we understand why we believe what we believe. And it's vital that we take a strong and bold stand for that. All right. So how do I get there? How do I become convicted in my beliefs? I think sometimes as, as especially if you, if you grew up in the church, um, like I did. I, I grew up, my dad is a preacher, and uh, have known about the Bible and uh, about Jesus since I was young. And so sometimes the taboo is don't ever ask any questions, right? Don't ever question why we believe what we believe. Don't ever raise those, those questions or raise those flags. But I'm here to tell you this morning that if you want to become convicted about Jesus, you have to ask questions. You have to ask questions. Sometimes our questions are going to need answers. Now, there's a caveat to this. I'm not saying question everything that anyone has ever said to you <laughs> about Jesus. But sometimes our questions are going to need answers. And you know what? Interestingly enough, the disciples needed some of their questions answered too. From Jesus. And I have all these passages mentioned. In all of these passages, the disciples ask Jesus 
a question about why he's doing what he's doing or why he's teaching what he's teaching. They asked him. They said, when Jesus said it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle, they said, who can be saved? They asked Jesus, when Jesus cast out a demon, they said, why couldn't we do that? The disciples needed some of their questions answered. And in many cases, and on many occasions, Jesus gave them the answer that they expected. What I want to remind you of this morning is not only did the disciples ask questions and need some answers to those questions, but that actually God encourages us to ask. And I want to go to Matthew chapter 7, and I know you guys know this passage. You've heard it. We sing it. We sing it in a song. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, going through verse, uh, let's see what verse that. verse 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You know, I, I think a lot of times when we read Matthew chapter 7, we think about material things, don't we? That we ask for something, and God will give us that thing. But we can't forget that even in this scenario, we can apply asking for answers. Asking for answers to our question. And in this passage, God and Jesus actually gives us confidence that we can expect an answer from Him. Again, it may not be the, uh, the answer that we want, but God does give us that confidence in His desire to address our needs. The key is going to Him, right? Going to Him, asking for the answers. But if we want to be convicted in our faith, sometimes we're going to need to ask questions and sometimes we're going to need those answers. And I want to encourage you this morning, if that is you, maybe you have questions, raise those questions. Ask somebody. Ask somebody that you trust. Ask someone who knows the scriptures and can give you a reasonable answer like we talked about with, with uh, Peter and John of why we believe what we believe. Secondly, We also have to consider the evidence. Similarly, it, it's okay to ask for evidence about the things that we believe. And again, the disciples needed evidence in order to, to come to their own conclusions about who Jesus was. And what's interesting about this, if you go back to Luke chapter 4, um, and I just kind of want to take you on a little bit of a journey here of, of Luke really in, in relation to Peter. Luke chapter 4, verses 38 through 39, Jesus comes in and he actually heals Peter's mother-in-law right in front of him. Heals her and she gets up and, and she serves everybody in verse 39. But what we don't see from Peter is, oh wow, you are the son of God and I'm going to leave everything and follow you. We don't see that until the next chapter actually. Jesus, or Peter, and some of his friends are fishing on a boat, and Jesus comes up to them and tells them they're not catching any fish, tells them to cast their net on the other side. They pull in a net full of fish. And then we see a little bit more of that faith being bolstered in Peter, don't we? He says in verse 8, When Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. So we do see some of that faith starting to build in Peter. And these men actually leave everything in verse 11, and they start to follow Jesus. But we're still not quite there yet as far as Peter coming to a full understanding of who Jesus was. Three chapters later, chapter 8, 
In verse 25, they're on the sea and the winds and the waves are throwing the boat back and forth and they're scared. And Jesus tells them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, who can this be? For he commands even the winds and water and they obey him. They had heard Jesus say who he was. And here they are questioning, who is this man? Who exactly is this man? But finally, in chapter 9, we see Peter coming to that full conviction of who Jesus is. In verses 18 through 20, it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. Six chapters later, from chapter 4, is that right? Whatever that math is, 4 to 9. All that time passes and we don't see Peter confessing Jesus as the Christ until chapter 9. Peter saw a lot of evidence, but he needed more of it, didn't he? He saw him heal his mother-in-law. He saw him uh, bring forth this great catch of fish and other miracles. But it's not until chapter 9 that we see that. And, and, and even after confessing their belief in Jesus... They still needed to increase their faith. In Matthew chapter 17, this is Matthew's account of what we read in Matthew chapter, or Luke 9. In Matthew 17, chapter 16, they confessed Jesus. Peter does the exact same thing. He says, we believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. And then in chapter 17, the very next chapter, we talked about how they asked why they couldn't cast out this demon in verses 19 through 20. And Jesus' response is because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So even after confessing his faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus acknowledges Peter and the other disciples needed an increase in their faith and in their conviction. My point is this, becoming convicted doesn't happen overnight. Maybe for some people it does, but coming to a firm stance or position or view like we defined it earlier, conviction of Jesus, just like the disciples, we're going to need to take into and consider the evidence that has been presented to us of Jesus being the Son of God and come to our own conclusions on its truthfulness. So my encouragement to you is ask for the evidence. Examine the evidence. Does the evidence prove that Jesus is the Christ and that he's the Son of God, as Peter confessed it in Luke 9 and Matthew 16? Lastly, how we become convicted in our beliefs Ultimately, a faith that is tested, that is a faith that has moved from belief to conviction. And I'm talking about on the other end of it. <laughs> Sometimes people's faith is tested and they aren't convicted. But when we make it through those tests, we come out the other side more convicted of the truth of Jesus and of the power of God. I want to give you an example of this. Turn to John chapter 4. There's a man who came to Jesus as a nobleman in Cana of Galilee. It tells us in verse 46. And he comes up to Jesus and he's asking him to come and heal his son because he was about to die. It tells us in verse 47. And in verse 49, uh, well, let's read verse 48. Unless Jesus responds, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. What we end up seeing is 
when he's on his way back in verse 51, someone comes and says, your son lives. And he asks him when he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And it says, the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. What we see in this man is a tested faith, don't we? Jesus tests this man. And he actually says to the whole crowd, unless you see a miracle, you're not going to believe. And in the midst of this whole crowd, gives an example of a very, of a very man who believed without seeing. <laughs> he believed the word of Jesus. He trusted it. And when he gets home, he realizes that his son is actually healed. And not only himself, but his whole household is convicted of who Jesus is and what he's capable of doing. There's a lot of examples we could look to. I have another one, but I don't think we'll have time to look at it. But Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 46, similar kind of thing. We become convicted when our faith is put to the test. Yes, we may believe like this man did. He believed. He trusted Jesus at his word. But he came out the other end even more convicted of who Jesus was. When we face those tests, when we face those trials of our faith, we can come out the other side even more convinced of what Jesus is capable of doing and what God can do in our lives. All right, so I want to talk real quickly along those lines. What kinds of tests will we face as we move from belief to a convicted faith? There's a lot of things that we could face. Let me just start off by saying that. But I want to give you an example. And um, Josh had this, this passage up. And actually, ever since he asked me to do this, uh, uh, he mentioned this passage, and it's been on my mind. Uh, but in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, Jesus tells a parable about a woman. It says, in Luke chapter 18, let's just go ahead and read it. Would someone read Luke 18, 1 through 8 for me? Got it. He spoke a parable to them and said uh, that the men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, Now there was a certain city, a judge, who did not fear God and did not, uh, nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for my adversary. And he said he would not, uh, sorry, he would not for a while. But afterwards he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard the man, yet I will, yet because of this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest her continual coming, uh, she may become weird to me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and God shall not, God shall, sorry, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out of the day and night to him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will find out, uh, he will find faith on the earth. All right, thank you. Let me just ask you guys, what kind of tests does this woman face here in her faith? In this parable. Okay, not getting what she wants. What else? Not only not getting what she wants, but not getting it when she wants it, right? She wanted it the first time she asked for it. And she didn't get it then. That was a test. Another thing is the fact that she has to keep coming back to this guy and asking him for justice. She's continually going back. And that's really the whole point of the parable, right? Jesus says, I'm t or tells us in, in verse 1, he's telling this parable that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. And there's just, this is this, the two tests that I want to emphasize because I think this is true in many um, trials that we face. There are two major tests I think we face sometimes in our faith, and that is prayer and timing. Prayer and timing. The woman in this parable emphasizes a necessity to keep believing 
And the key is in times where giving up seems reasonable. <laughs> it, seems, it would seem reasonable, wouldn't, wouldn't it, if this woman had just gave up and said, you know what, this guy's not going to do what I want. I'm just going to stop bothering him. Doesn't that seem reasonable? And that's really the whole point that Jesus is making, is that even when it seemed reasonable, this woman kept coming back and asking because she knew what he could do. And that's the second part, right? She kept asking. Prayer, and this is really the whole point of this parable, prayer is a direct reflection of our faith. Think about that for a second. Prayer is a direct reflection of our faith. If we want something to happen, if we need God in a certain situation or scenario or trial, how much we're praying about that is going to show how much we believe that he can do that. Secondly, timing, like I mentioned, that's a major test for us. The sooner we accept that God doesn't work on our timetable, the greater faith we will have in his ability to act. Let me just give you an example. Where am I going to go to college? Some of you guys are going to college in, in a few months. Asking questions like that. You know, you're on a timetable, right? Where am I going to go to college? Who am I going to marry? What kind of person am I going to become? What is next year at school going to be like? What's it going to be like with my friends from last year? What, how's it going to be different? These tests, sometimes, even though they might be time sensitive, choosing where we're going to go to school, how we're going to be ready for the next year of school, or whatever it may be, recognizing again that God does not work on our timetable, that's greatly going to bolster our faith as soon as we understand that about him. And let me just go off here and just, in the Old Testament, really throughout the whole Bible, <laughs> and we just read an example of it, um, and we skipped an example of it in Luke chapter 8. What God loves to do, he loves to do things after the very last second. And you see that all throughout Scripture. In Luke chapter 8, what happened was Jairus came and asked Jesus to heal his daughter. Another woman comes up, touches the hem of his garment. Jesus spends his time talking to her. And then in the meantime, Jairus' daughter dies. But what ends up happening, Jesus says, if you believe, she can live again. Jesus goes in there and raises her from the dead. It's a perfect example of that. God and Jesus, they're not bound. They're not bound by timing. We've got to remember that. We've got to remember that when we're praying, when we're asking God for help and trials and temptations, that's going to be a test for us. But we have to remember that God does not work on our timetable. Though Jesus is encouraging us to pray and not lose heart here in Luke chapter 18, he still asks the question in verse 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Think about that. When Jesus returns, will he be pleased with how myself, my wife, you all, will he be pleased with how we handled those tests? When Jesus comes back, will he say, David, you were persistent in prayer. You believed that I could do what you wanted me to do, even when it seemed impossible. That's really what Jesus is saying here in Luke 18. How many of us are praying like this? How many of us are believing like this in God and his ability to work? Is Jesus going to be pleased with how we handled the tests of his timing and the tests of prayer in our life, like we see here in Luke 18? All right, a couple more things, and then we'll wrap up. I know this is a lot of 
points that I'm making, but how do we carry our conviction into times of temptation? Because that's, that's when it matters the most, isn't it? In times of temptation, when trials come, not just trials of our faith, but when we're tempted, when we're tempted to cuss, or we're tempted to lust after somebody, that's when it matters most, if we're convicted. How do we carry our convictions into times of temptations? Temptations really put our convictions to the test, and we demonstrate in those times if we're truly convicted or not. Think about Joseph. Joseph, day after day, Potiphar's wife, it tells us, day after day she was coming to him. And finally, she just straight up grabs him. And Joseph says, how can I do this in sin against God? Joseph was convicted. And he held on to those convictions day after day when he was tempted. Joshua is another good example. You remember Joshua? We quote it all the time. You see it in everybody's house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, when we fail, because we all fail, right? We all give in to temptation from time to time. When we fail in temptation, they often come not because of God's failure to deliver us, but our failure to ask God for help. Our failure to trust God and to demonstrate a living faith. Staying convicted and strong during temptation, that's when our faith is really tested, and that's when our faith needs to work. Are we going to act on our conviction, or are we going to give in to that temptation? I put up Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18, another passage that we're all very familiar with. But in this passage, Paul talks about the armor of God. And I just want to read, um, let's read verses 10 through 12, or actually 10 through 13. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And actually, let's just go ahead and read to verse 18. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let me just ask you, well, let me define one thing for you first. In, in uh, verse 11, it talks about, at least in the New King James Version, it says, uh, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Does anybody else's version say something different there? Wiles? Schemes? Yeah, I think that's a better English word, or at least modern word that we use. The schemes of the devil. Jesus is, or excuse me, Satan is trying to scheme us, isn't he? It's a scheme. It's a trick. It's a trap. And James talks about that. Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. These are just schemes, but the, the fact of the matter is, we fall into those schemes. So I want to ask you, what is Paul's solution to being ready for temptation, to being convicted and strong in times of temptation? What does he tell us in this passage? Look at those verses 10 through 18. Verse 10, what does he say? Okay, Paul's solution here, first, relying on the Lord's power. Be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. What else? 
Verse 11. What else can we do? Okay. Putting on the armor, right? He says it in verse 11. He says it in verse 13. Verses 14 through 17, he tells us what that armor is. Lastly, verse 18. And what we talked about last, in our last point is the emphasis that Paul puts on prayer. When we're relying on the power of the Lord, we're putting on His armor, we're staying convicted um, through prayer, sticking to our convictions in times of temptation is going to be much easier. But it's going to take that faith working through prayer, like Paul says, and it's going to take effort to stay armed with the armor of God. All right, I want to keep talking about that, but I know I don't have all day. So um, what kind of impact can our convictions make on those around us? This is what we want to do, right? I mean, we don't just... Yes, we want to be convicted in our beliefs. We want to be saved (laughs) ourselves. But as Christians, at the core of it, we want to help others be convicted too and to know the truth of Jesus. What kind of impact can our convictions make on those around us? Let me ask you, who are some examples of convicted believers that you know? Throw a name out there. They could be in this century or in the first century or in whatever century. Paul. Paul. It was the first one I thought of. <laughs> Peter. We saw it in Acts 4. Paul. There are even people today. I would say my dad. Elders in the church. There's lots of people that we could name that have made an influence on me because they were convicted. What impact has the convictions of those that you love and that have influenced you, what kind of impact has that made on you? You know, for me, again, my dad, my mom, Some people in the church, I mentioned some elders, lots of people, through their convictions, in turn, it's helped me be more convicted. They've been there to help answer those questions that I was talking about earlier. They've been there to help me consider the evidence of the things concerning Jesus and the things that we proclaim in our faith. As we go out into the world the response is going to be varying. (laughs) Not everyone is going to be convicted just because I'm convicted, right? Not everyone is going to come to faith in Jesus just because I proclaim faith in Jesus. Sometimes the response is going to be negative. Acts chapter 4, after Peter and John make this bold proclamation, and they're like, wow, these guys are so bold. We realize they've been with Jesus. They're uneducated, untrained men quoting the scriptures to us. Let's tell them to shut up. (laughs) That was their response. Let's tell them to shut up. And if they don't shut up, we're going to punish them. You've got to be ready for that. We all have to. I'm talking to myself here, right? We all have to be ready that even though we may have every strong conviction of why we believe what we believe and we proclaim that to people boldly, some people are going to just want us to shut up. We have to be ready for that. But (laughs) the positive side is that sometimes the response is going to be positive. Sometimes people are going to be convicted. We see that again in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17 here, when Paul goes into Athens, he goes into the Areopagus, and uh, he starts talking about Jesus, and they're like, what are these strange things that you're preaching about this guy? And so Paul ends up preaching... And once he starts talking about the resurrection, it tells us that some of them mocked, but others believed. And it actually gives us the name of some of those people that believed 
and were convicted of the truth of Jesus. Whether or not the response is negative or positive, our convictions will make an impact in the world. It will. And the world needs that. The world needs that. God needs us, you and me, to be convicted of the things that we proclaim about Jesus, about his word, about him. He needs us to be convicted so that we can help impact others to come to know, believe, and be convicted themselves. Whatever the response is, the message of Jesus can only be told through those who are convicted of its truth. And that's what God needs from us. All right, let's just kind of recap here. Simply claiming belief in something does not equate to true faith. Just because Jonathan said he believes that I wasn't going to hurt him doesn't mean he's going to go jump off the top of the building and trust I'm going to catch him, right? Again, I, please don't do that, John. Please don't do that, because I'm not going to catch you. <laughs> I'll try, but simply claiming belief, again, does not mean that we have true faith. We have to become convicted. And ultimately, what we're talking about this weekend, faith working, our faith is never going to work. It's never going to work if we aren't convicted in why we believe what we believe. Asking questions and asking for evidence are essential if we want to be convicted in our beliefs. And remember, the disciples did the same thing. They needed the same thing. Don't be ashamed of that. Go into it with confidence that you can find answers. You can ask and you will receive. Our prayer lives and God's timing are going to be tests for us. And again, that, you know, there's a lot of things I could have thrown in there, but I think these are two big things. How are we going to hold up during those tests? How are we going to hold up? <laughs> Is Jesus going to find us continuing in that prayer like he talks about and continuing in our faith and not losing heart? A working faith works through prayer especially in times of temptation. And that's Ephesians chapter 6, right? And I love that. Paul talks about being strong in the power of the Lord. He talks about putting on the armor of God and how he ends it all, it says, praying always. Always praying, right? Always making supplications for ourselves in behalf of our brethren. A working faith works through prayer. When we are convicted, we can make an impact through bold yet sound and reasonable, like we talked about, proclamation of our faith in Jesus.